Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In today's video, we delve into hemorrhagic disorders and laboratory assessment. In this video, we'll delve into the intricacies of severe bleeding, its causes, and how physicians conduct crucial diagnostic assessments. Hemorrhage, or severe bleeding, can take various forms, localized or general, acquired or congenital. It necessitates careful examination and intervention. Localized bleeding, often stemming from injury, infection, tumor, or specific blood vessel defects, requires meticulous attention. Think inadequately cauterized or ineffectively sutured surgical sites. Notably, localized bleeding usually doesn't signal blood vessel defects, platelet issues, thrombocytopenia, or coagulation factor deficiencies. Now, let's explore generalized bleeding, which involves multiple sites, spontaneous bleeds, or situations requiring intervention and transfusions. Generalized bleeding could indicate primary hemostasis disorders like blood vessel defects, platelet issues, thrombocytopenia, or secondary hemostasis characterized by coagulation factor deficiencies. Generalized bleeding can manifest in two patterns, mucocutaneous, systemic, or anatomic, soft tissue. Let's break them down. Mucocutaneous hemorrhage, including petechiae, purpura, and ecchymosis, often suggests primary hemostasis disorders. Symptoms may involve bleeding from gums, uncontrolled nosebleeds, vomiting of blood, or profuse menstrual flow. Conditions like thrombocytopenia, platelet disorders, von Willebrand disease, or vascular disorders are often linked to mucocutaneous bleeding. Distinguishing between mucocutaneous and anatomic bleeding guides laboratory testing and treatment. Anatomic, soft tissue, hemorrhage is associated with defects in secondary hemostasis or coagulation factor deficiencies. This includes recurrent bleeding after trauma or surgical procedures. Internal anatomic bleeds may lack visible signs initially but can lead to joint swelling, acute pain, and damage to organs or nerves. Laboratory testing is crucial for suspected mucocutaneous or soft tissue disorders. This includes a complete blood count, prothrombin time, partial thromboplastin time, fibrinogen assay, and the rapid thromboelastography. Thromboelastography provides rapid information on clotting, strength, and fibrinolysis within 15 minutes. Interpretation by experienced laboratory practitioners is key. Acquired versus congenital bleeding disorders. Bleeding can be linked to a myriad of conditions, from liver disease and kidney failure to chronic infections, autoimmune disorders, obstetric complications, and more. Whether it's trauma, dietary deficiencies, or inflammatory disorders, bleeding can manifest in various ways. Now, let's differentiate between acquired and congenital bleeding disorders. If bleeding episodes surface in adulthood, tied to a specific disease or trauma and not observed in relatives, it's likely acquired. When adults with generalized hemorrhage seek treatment, physicians conduct thorough investigations into underlying diseases, considering personal and family history, age, sex, pregnancy history, systemic disorders, trauma, and drug exposure. The physician meticulously assesses the trigger, location, and volume of bleeding, ordering laboratory assays after establishing abnormal bleeding through history and examination. But here's the catch, laboratory tests aren't one-size-fits-all. Indiscriminate screens for healthy individuals may lead to false positives. Now, let's shift our focus to congenital bleeding disorders, rare and affecting less than 1 in 100 people. Typically diagnosed in infancy or early childhood, these disorders often showcase similar symptoms in relatives. Congenital bleeding disorders can lead to recurrent, spontaneous, or injury-related bleeding in unexpected locations, joints, body cavities, retinal veins and arteries, or the central nervous system. Interestingly, mild congenital hemorrhagic disorders may remain asymptomatic until adulthood or a physical challenge like trauma, dental extraction, or surgery. Let's talk about the common players in congenital deficiencies, von Willebrand disease, factor 8 and 9 deficiencies, hemophilia A and B, and platelet function disorders. And for the rarity enthusiasts, inherited deficiencies of fibrinogen, prothrombin, and factors V, 7, X, 11, and 13 are indeed rare gems. Acquired coagulopathies. Acquired bleeding disorders, more common than inherited coagulopathies, often stem from trauma, drug exposure, or chronic conditions. Chronic conditions like liver disease, vitamin K deficiency, and renal failure are known culprits, necessitating laboratory tests for confirmation and guidance in managing acquired hemorrhagic events. Let's talk about trauma, a leading cause of death, 
with unintentional injuries being the primary culprit, causing 93,000 deaths annually in the United States. Shockingly, severe neurologic displacement accounts for 50% of trauma deaths, with 20,000 initial survivors succumbing to hemorrhage within 48 hours. Enter ACOTS, acute coagulopathy of trauma shock, the silent but deadly culprit responsible for fatal hemorrhage. ACOTS is characterized by hemostasis deficiency triggered by injury-related acute inflammation, platelet activation, tissue factor release, hypothermia, acidosis, and hypoperfusion, elements of systemic shock. Emergency medical technicians play a crucial role, using colloid plasma expanders for in-transit fluid resuscitation to counter hypoperfusion. Yet, the debate persists, plasma or colloids? Some trauma specialists advocate for plasma over colloids to control coagulopathy. Challenges abound in management. Colloids and red blood cell transfusions, while essential, can intensify coagulopathy, as can subsequent surgical intervention. And then there's massive transfusion, a critical intervention for trauma victims meeting specific conditions. Massive transfusion, defined as administering more than 3 RBC units within 1 hour or 8 to 10 units within 24 hours, is crucial for otherwise healthy trauma victims when specific conditions, such as low blood pressure. But how do we navigate RBC transfusions? The American Society of Anesthesiologists has guidelines. According to these guidelines, RBC transfusions are necessary when hemoglobin falls below 6.0 grams per deciliter and are not recommended when it exceeds 10.0 grams per deciliter. When hemoglobin levels are between 6.0 and 10.0 grams per deciliter, decisions depend on urgency, physical signs of blood loss, current rate of blood loss, blood pressure, arterial blood gas values, urine output, and laboratory evidence of coagulopathy. Acute coagulopathy of trauma shock management, RBCs. First up, let's talk about red blood cells, and the guidelines set by the American Society of Anesthesiologists. According to these guidelines, RBC transfusions are deemed necessary when hemoglobin levels fall below 6.0 grams per deciliters, but interestingly, not recommended when it exceeds 10.0 grams per deciliters. But what about the gray area between 6.0 and 10.0 grams per deciliters? Decision-making becomes nuanced. The decision to transfuse hinges on the urgency of the patient's condition, assessed through physical signs of blood loss, the rate of blood loss, blood pressure, arterial blood gas values, urine output, and laboratory evidence of coagulopathy. Acute coagulopathy of trauma shock management, plasma. Now, let's shift our focus to plasma, a key player in managing acute coagulopathy of trauma shock. Plasma has undergone an evolution in its preparation, transitioning from the traditional fresh frozen plasma, FFP, to the contemporary FP-24 process. Thawed plasma, a product of the FP-24 or FFP thawing process, may pose challenges in certain conditions like von Willebrand disease or hemophilia. High-volume trauma centers may keep a small inventory of thawed plasma for immediate use in emergencies. When is plasma transfusion warranted? It comes into play when microvascular bleeding occurs, and PT or PTT is prolonged beyond specific intervals. Additionally, it's used in cases of known pre-existing single coagulation factor deficiencies, significant volume replacement, and hemorrhage complicated by or caused by Coumadin overdose. Optimal ratios are crucial. Traditionally, a 1 to 4 plasma to RBC ratio is recommended, but recent studies hint at the effectiveness of a 1 to 1 ratio, providing better stability. The standard adult plasma dosage is 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram in continuous infusion, aiming for 30% coagulation factor activity for all factors, mindful of the risk of transfusion-associated circulatory overload. It's essential to be aware of potential adverse effects. Plasma administration may lead to transfusion-associated circulatory overload, TACO, transfusion-related acute lung injury, trolley, thrombosis, anaphylaxis, and multiple organ failure. Vigilance is key to ensure the benefits outweigh the risks. Acute coagulopathy of trauma shock management, platelet concentrate. In the realm of surgery, evaluating coagulopathy becomes an art. Microvascular bleeding and estimating blood volume guide the way. When the platelet count falls below 50,000 per milliliter or significant blood loss is anticipated, enter platelet concentrate. But it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Conditions like immune thrombocytopenic purpura, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia may not benefit from platelet concentrate therapy. Ordering platelet concentrate is a careful decision. Avoiding it when the platelet count exceeds 100,000 per ml, 
but considering it for bleeding into confined spaces like the brain or eye when the count is between 50,000 and 100,000 per milliliter. Platelet administration may also be required if the patient is using antiplatelet agents, such as aspirin, clopidogrel, prosugrel, or ticograler, has a known platelet disorder, or is undergoing surgery involving cardiopulmonary bypass, which suppresses platelet activity. Acute coagulopathy of trauma shock management, components and concentrates. Transfusion service directors strategically turn to these alternatives to mitigate risks like transfusion-associated circulatory overload, TACO, and transfusion-related acute lung injury trolley, aiming to enhance patient outcomes while conserving precious resources. Let's explore some key players in this realm, starting with activated prothrombin complex concentrate, or PCC. Activated PCCs, like FIBA or Autoplex T, can be a game-changer, administered at a dosage of 50 units per kg every 12 hours, not exceeding 200 units per kg in 24 hours. But, and it's a crucial but, the dose-response relationship varies among recipients, and the use of activated PCCs raises the specter of disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Enter safer non-activated PCCs, like Xentra. While its use in acute coagulopathy of trauma shock is off-label, it provides a potentially safer route. Now, let's introduce a stalwart companion, tranexamic acid, or TXA. FDA cleared in 1986, TXA is a trusted antifibrinolytic drug, known for preventing bleeding in hemophilic patients undergoing invasive procedures. In the realm of ACOTS, TXA proves effective, though its use is considered off-label for this specific purpose. When microvascular bleeding strikes and fibrinogen levels dip below 100 mg per deciliter, cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, RESTAP, comes to the rescue. A 15 to 20 milliliters unit of cryoprecipitate provides 150 to 250 milligrams of fibrinogen, with a lower risk of TACO compared to colloids or plasma. Tailoring solutions to the patient's needs, Vaughn Willebrand factor and factor 8 concentrates. When deficiencies exist, these concentrates step in, while plasma and PCCs may contribute to reducing factor 8 levels. Enter the contender, recombinant activated coagulation factor 7, or Novo 7. FDA cleared for treating hemophilia A or B, its off-label use in a COTS at a dosage of 30 mg per kilogram effectively halts microvascular hemorrhage in non-hemophilic trauma victims. A word of caution, while Novo 7 doesn't induce DIC, a potential link to arterial and venous thrombosis has been suggested in patients with existing thrombotic risk factors. Acute coagulopathy of trauma shock, monitoring therapy. Meet the unsung heroes, TEG and TM technology, wielded by skilled operators to monitor a plethora of therapies for ACOTS. Whether it's plasma, PCCs, activated PCC, four-factor PCC, tranexamic acid, TXA, or recombinant activated coagulation factor 7, TEG and TEM provide a real-time window into their effectiveness. Now, let's delve into assessing the effectiveness of fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate. Enter the fibrinogen assay. This crucial tool allows medical professionals to gauge the impact on fibrinogen levels, ensuring the clotting cascade remains robust. Laboratory directors guide the way. Surgeons and emergency department physicians are advised to indirectly monitor ACOTS therapies. How? By checking for the correction of platelet count, PT, and PTT to within their respective reference intervals. Let's talk platelets. Platelet agrogometry steps in to measure post-therapy platelet function. Coagulation factor assays follow up on PT and PTT, ensuring the target activity of 30% has been achieved. Tradition meets innovation. While traditional approaches like PT, PTT, platelet count, and function assays are accepted, TEG and TEM bring a new dimension. Why? Because they provide immediate feedback, possibly more sensitive to those small physiological improvements that make a world of difference. And now, the light at the end of the tunnel once a COTS has been stabilized. Additional therapy related to hemostasis becomes a rarity. It's a testament to the precision and effectiveness of modern monitoring techniques. Please don't forget to subscribe our channel, activate notifications to get our new videos. Press like, leave a comment or if you have any question below and share the video with your friends.